from Okoa, Kenya to Pesa Mashinani and now a new development in the push offered by members of parliament to change the date for the general elections in Kenya. Yes, and the question is, of course, can the MPs change the 2017 election date from August to December? Well, the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission has burst that bubble. Yes, the IABC chairperson says that changing the election date would require a constitutional referendum. Here's Asha Mwilu opening KTN Prime tonight with that story. MPs have so far been confident that they could easily change the date of the next election from August to December 2017. But the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission says Parliament has its facts all wrong. At a workshop to evaluate last year's general election, IEBC said there's only one way to change the election date. I know Parliament has, the Parliamentary Committee has, has prepared a draft bill to amend the election date from August to December. But that is a debate which, uh, as a Kenyans, we'll have to uh, have and agree whether that's the way we need to go. And if that happens, that may require a referendum. IEBC Chairperson Ahmed Isaac Hassan lays the basis of his argument on Article 102.1 of the Constitution that states that the term of each House of Parliament expires on the date of the next general election. Article 136.2 is clear on what date that is. The article states that an election of the President shall be held on the same day as the general election of MPs, that is, the second Tuesday in August, every fifth year. Since the election date affects the term of office of the president, the constitution provides that there must be a referendum to change it. Look at the articles defining the election date in the constitution. As far as we are concerned, it is August 2017. With MPs adamant on their push to extend their term to December 2017, IBC's declaration could send the legislators back to the drawing board. The National Assembly was well on its way in debating the prospects of changing the election date. Ugenya MP David Ocheng sponsored a bill to change the poll date. This is the first constitution. And so one house of the parliament or the senate or the council assembly or the governor will have to lose something for us to then move on to have the five years complete. After we do it in August 2017, from then it will become completely very easy to understand how the five years are completed. This is not the first time that the courts will have to give a legal opinion concerning the election date. In 2012, the Court of Appeal reinstated the August date for the 2017 general election following a political storm over the interpretation of the Constitution. Asham will locate TN, Nairobi. Let's move away from politics for a bit to some tragic news from Garissa where six people died following a road accident involving three vehicles in the Tula area on the Garissa Mwingi Highway. Police say preliminary investigations show that a speeding car with six passengers on board caused the crash during an attempt to overtake and Linda Ogutu has the details. Tiny little pieces that made up a Toyota Pro Box that collided head-on with a lorry which was coming from Nairobi. It is a collision that happened at around 6 a.m. at Tula area, 80 kilometers from Garissa town. An eyewitness says speeding may have been the cause of the collision that saw six people lose their lives in a road that is rarely used. <laughs> He says the impact of the crash was so hard that all the occupants of the pro box died on the spot. And even as the wreckage was being towed, residents here took a peek to see what was left of the car. The driver of this car is said to have attempted to overtake another car. Area police say drivers using the road do not take precautions when using the road since it's not a busy road. This, they say, is their undoing. The driver of the Matatu was also injured and rushed to Garissa Referral Hospital. Linda Gutu, KTN Prime.
very sad incident. Now, the Speaker of the National Assembly, Justin Muturi, Muturi, has promised a dialogue with stakeholders on the controversial Powers and Privileges Bill 2014, which does seek to bar the media from scrutinizing Parliament. The Speaker, who held a meeting with editors, said that some of the restrictions that the bill seeks to introduce are actually already provided for in the Constitution. Rita Tinina tells us more. It was an unusual breakfast meeting between the speaker and editors coming just days after the editors guild raised opposition to the powers and privileges bill 2014. And even before the speaker, the editors were sticking to their script. This law should not be passed in its current form because it will impede the same rights that are guaranteed under the Constitution. The bill by Das MP Adan Kanan seeks to, among other things, impose a half a million shilling fine and jail term for journalists who publish reports perceived to defame Parliament. It also seeks to limit media access to the proceedings of Parliament and its committees. Media freedom is fundamental for democracy. It's a prerequisite for a successive democracy in the society. You have no choice as a parliament but to be a progressive parliament, being the first one elected under this new constitution. And the media may have an ally in National Assembly Speaker Justin Muturi. Some of the things that some of the issues you've raised, and I've seen some of them, I, I agree totally. Section 34 of this bill, when I saw it, I wondered whether, whether, the, whether the mover had actually read the constitution. So you are right. The speaker says some of the proposals in the bill are already provided for in the constitution. You cannot begin to, 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 to create other offenses. We already have the offense of criminal libel, don't we? It is there. The offense of criminal, criminal libel is there. The offense of defamation, whether you call parliament MPs or what, this is, free, this is freedom of expression. That bill, in, uh, in my opinion, and I've spoken to it earlier, uh, has serious reservations. The National Assembly Speaker had some much needed assurance for journalists. Be assured that you will not be impeded in the performance of your duties. That I can, I can guarantee you. The bill is set to go for its second reading. The Speaker, who is also the Chairman of the Powers and Privileges Committee, which will handle the bill, is promising more dialogue over the bill before it is tabled before the floor of the House for debate. The Chairman of the Commission on the Implementation of the Constitution, Charles Nyechai, had already advised the National Assembly clerk, Justin Bundy, that 23 clauses in the bill were unconstitutional and needed amendments before passing into law. Nyachai warned the bill could be used to curtail freedom of expression. The Media Owners Association, the Editors Guild, and the Kenya Parliamentary Journalists Association have also voiced their disappointment with Canaan's bill, warning they would go to court to challenge the constitutionality if it is passed into law. Rita Tinina, KTN. Let's go to that incident in Migori and the president's political advice has said that the chaos that marred the pres uh, president Uhuru Kenyatta's function in Migori will not deter him from going back to that county to initiate other projects soon. The, this came as leaders from both sides of the political divide today condemned the chaotic scenes at Migori Primary School yesterday. KTN's Fredo Mulo gives us this story. <laughs> The disruption of President Uhuru's bid to launch an anti-malaria exercise came under the microscope as the magnitude of the matter continues to unfold. Ostensibly the handiwork of politicians engaged in a supremacy battle, the incident forced ODM leaders to distance themselves from the hooligans. We have been, this, we have been shamed in our own backyard and for that we wish to apologize and with humility ask the president that he should not be they should not think it at, at it is all of Nyanza. He it came is. specifically for development purposes. It was not politics at all. In fact, it was there for many hours. But there was nothing like politics. It is important for our people to differentiate politics and 
development. Jubilee leaders also jumped into the fray to hammer at ODM, which has this year had a run of chaotic scenes where its officials are present. Therefore, our appeal, and specifically to those who support the president, the stronghold of the president areas, I think we would like to tell them that they should remain calm at all times, even if they are having visitors from other areas of this country, let them treat them with dignity. Let them treat from none other than the top leadership of ODM, none other than the former Prime Minister, the Honorable Raila Odinga, is a public apology to the institution and the person of the presidency in this republic. Speaking in Kisumu, TNS Secretary General Onyango Olo went a step further and accused elements of the civil service of mishandling the event by forming parallel security networks that failed while demanding an apology to the president. The Kikuyu Council of Elders also weighed in on the issue. We are not calling for the hirelings to come and apologize or condemn the act. We are asking the top leadership of ODM that they must be bold enough to come and condemn the act of their hirelings who tried to interrupt a presidential function. Everyone knows that this was not a political function. It was a function that was intended to address issues that affect the inhabitants of Migori country and the country at large. Speaking to KTN on phone, the president's advisor Joshua Kutun confirmed that the president has downplayed the incident and is planning to return to Bigori County next month to launch more projects that he skipped yesterday due to time constraints. Fredo Mulo, KTN Prime. The Big Q in association with Kenya Power. So, of course, this heckling incident is something that everyone's been talking about. And there we've actually seen an accusation that these could have been ODM hirelings. But the question we're asking you this evening is, do you believe that the heckling at President Uhuru's Migori function was, in fact, pre-planned? That's our big cue tonight. Well, you can't get us on SMS. You can get us on 22155. That's the SMS line. You can get us on Twitter, at Wilson underscore Mburu, at Kachungira. Uh, you can also get us on at Katie and Kenya will, of course, continue to sample some of your views as the bulletin continues. Well, next tonight, we head to Kuala, where the High Court has ordered the exhumation of the body of a 14-year-old girl who was shot dead by a policeman in Kuala under unclear circumstances. High Court Judge Martin Muya granted an application to have the body of Kwekwe Mwandaza exhumed for an independent forensic audit. Police shot Kwekwe two weeks ago in Kuala in an incident that the police service described as self-defense. Police claim that Kwekwe assaulted them at night with a panga before one of their officers fired at her. However, human rights organizations have disputed the explanation and interpreted it as another trigger-happy moment. Muslims for Human Rights and a legal team led by John Kaminwa and Harun Dubi are now demanding justice for the family, which claims that even the burial was conducted without their consent. Muhuri's executive director, Khalifa Kalef, has told KTN that the exhumation will be carried out on Friday. Orders sought for exhumation of the body of Pekwe and the conducting of a second post-mortem examination. It is ordered that exhumation of the body of the deceased be carried or conducted as prayed and leave to conduct an independent post-mortem examination is hereby granted. I shall now at the from police being suspected of murder, let's go to others being arrested for being police imposters. Three men alleged to have been masquerading as police officers and terrorizing residents of Nakuru County will spend the night in police custody, real police custody. Nakuru Deputy AP Commander Bernabas Kimutai said the three have been carrying out criminal activities while wearing police uniforms. Kamchamenza has that story. Oh, 
It was not a normal afternoon for these three. Angry residents claimed the three suspects have been harassing them, especially at Kivumbini, Manyani, and Kaloleni, among other areas. This one was allegedly caught wearing real police uniforms. The hair not real though. They were allegedly posing as officers, especially during the night. Nakuru Deputy AP Commandant Barnabas Kimutai, who with other officers cornered the suspects after a tip off from the public, says the three are in a group known as Bongo 4, which they have been tracing for the last one month. Lakini wakati lipo mwarezi huyu, nushukiwa wakwanza, akatuelekeza kwa Desmond. Ambapo sasa, inamanisha sasa Desmond, ndi alimuzia nani? Inspector Kimutai later revealed that one of the suspects is an ex-police officer, but the suspect Desmond Kariuki Mutune denied that he had been fired from the service, insisting he was only temporarily suspended. I'm interdicted, I'm, I'm not dismissed. And so far, vitu kaa ukora kaa kaa hizi zene zinapatikana hapa, mii misi usiki. And so far, and so far, I've been arrested because of something of which I don't know. Even I don't know this man. Bundo wa reniuzia. Na hiku wa kaya kazi ya timbaya. Irongi ni kari ya kesha kongu. No ini ni nunguwa miyatatu. Ni vage wakati kukona baridni ndani. Na hiku wa kazi mbaya. Aijawai kupalika kwanza, officer yote ambaye iko interdicted, anakuwa confined within the lines. Lakini yule ametoka katika police lines na kuweta kufanya vitendofi yake, tuna rikatu huyo sasa kama ni, siyo mutu sawa. Kwa sababu anafaa katika, awe katika police lines, mpaka siku hile atakapopata parua ya dismissal. Lakini huyo ame break out of police lines. The three are in custody at Bondeni Police Station awaiting further investigations. Kamche Menza KTN from Nakuru County. People should not be allowed to say such things. <laughs> you know, what I'm trying to understand is the fake hair though. I'm not sure why. It's not a very effective disguise. If you're going to impersonate a police officer i think you probably should just get better hair <laughs> you yeah. need to be very brave to do that was that a man or a woman oh that i'm not sure actually but while the nakuru residents were happy about the arrest of those alleged police imposters it was a rather strange twist in the tale for some along thicker road now a group of civilians held violent protests in support of a police officer who was arrested and charged with murder the protesters blocked the Thika superhighway, demanding the release of Constable Titus Musila. Dorcas Wangira has more. For the better part of the morning, the busy Thika superhighway, both the underpass and overpass remained impassable. Police moved in fast. This time, the protest was in support of a police officer, Constable Titus Musila. Ukimpigia simu katito, we have a problem katito mbaka kudesiki. Tunajua katito, akitoka hapa, kutagu juzi wakati ya meshiko, tumenyo ganyoko hapa sana. <laughs> the Nairobi-based constable was arrested last week on September the 4th. He is accused of killing Kenneth Kimani Mwangi in Githurai in Nairobi on April 14th last year. On Friday, he was charged in court for the murder, following a recommendation by the Independent Policing Oversight Authority. Since he's quite an efficient officer, quite devoted, uh, he has been able to make sure that at least one age are, uh, are comfortable. Ipoa, which investigated the death, opened inquiries after a key suspect in the trial, Oscar Mushoki Mwangi, was shot dead on August the 24th, three days later. The slain victims were brothers. The civilians wanted the police officer set free and charges dropped. A rare occurrence. In the past, public protests have been over police brutality and extrajudicial killings.
Na kama sisi wenyewe tu tunaishi hapa na tunajua hawa watu wana wanu wa hizi. Sisi ndio inafaa tusema katika wameua mtu innocent. Niko Mr. was all alone. And so he had to make to make sure that he uses all means uh, necessary to make sure that his life was safe was safe and the lives of the people around who are safe. This case is bound to test relations between the DPP, IPOA and the police. The officer had remained at large two weeks after his initial arrest warrant was issued and now the public is rallying behind him. Dorka Swangira, KTN. Let's go straight to Mandera and those found culpable of the Wajia Mandera inter-clan conflicts will be put behind bars. This is according to the Interior and Coordination of National Government Cabinet Secretary Joseph Alelenku and the Inspector General of Police David Kimayo speaking while visiting affected areas. The duo condemned the conflict, terming it as a hindrance to development in the region. They said most homes, villages and schools remained deserted and urged school administrators to, and parents rather, to allow the children to attend schools, assuring them that security will be provided. Since May, the Gare and the Godia inter-clan conflict witnessed in both Wajia and Mandera counties have been over 100, have seen over 100 people dead and thousands displaced. To the international law crime, for those people who will be affected, for all these atrocities of crime that has been committed to the people of this place. We thank you, Wanainji Mukawu Salama, Mutubashi Abari, Ili, Wale Wachambasi, Wakitoka Ngambu, Wakiwa Ndani Humu, Wote Washikwe. Tangu liini maskari ya zirikali unapikuwa kari kama chana usiku. Wengine wakiongozi wa meaka hapa wako kwa rada. Reporti zinatayarishwa na tutawashika. Hatuwezi endelea kulalamika kwamba sisi Northeastern tunabaguliwa Kwa sababu wakuna watoto yetu wanaenda shule chuo kikuu kwa sababu kila mtu wako na grade mbaya na mnaendelea kufanya shule sifungwe. Shule sifunguliwe, administrative officers wa serikali, chief, DO na polisi tuwakisha hizo shule sumefunguliwa na nyiwa zasi mpeleke watoto wenu shule ndiyo muweze kupata maendeleo kama taifa. Right, let's take a look at some other news from different parts of the country. Let's go to the central region in particular, where Carol Nderi is. She's our reporter there. Now, Carol, something interesting is going on in Embu, isn't there? The Council of Elders are actually marshalling together to collect signatures. Is that correct? Thank you very much, Nancy Kashungira. Yes, indeed, that is what is happening in Embu County. The Council of Elders that goes by the name Nyange and Diriri have come out in support of the referendum and they've kicked off a collection of signatures saying that they are in fully in support of the referendum and in particular they want article 11 of the constitution amended so that elders, community elders can have their roles defined uh, for example in matters of dispute resolution and in some aspects of culture they also are reaching out to President Uru Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto to at least uh, try and uh, listen to every Kenyan, that every Kenyan has a democratic right to support either the referendum, those who are for it or against it. Take a look. Nisi kama wase wa embu tukakachini, tukaangaria, tukaona abadhali tuunge referenda mumukono. Now, that's quite interesting considering that this is, of course, a jubilee stronghold. But another interesting story, and this, this one absolutely touched my heart, a group of schoolgirls are doing something very, very special, aren't they, in Muranga? Yes, Nancy, uh, we've seen the philanthropic spirit of students of Getuge Secondary School in Mathioya, that is in Moranga County, who have come out in support of one of their own. They're raising funds to help 17-year-old Stella Wangoya, form three student who is suffering from acute kidney failure. And it has been hard on the family emotionally and financially. And so the students have said that they can try and help collect funds and raise funds for Stella, who has been in hospital, uh, you know, more than she has been in class. So this is also affecting her studies but at least uh, being students of course they do not have much money but they know that if they marshal uh, support and they stick together then they might be able to raise funds for Stella who needs an uh, urgent uh, kidney transplant both kidneys are not uh, working as they should so they're raising money for that take Kenyatta wakanyambia nikona na kidney failure sasa nimekuwa nikieda dialysis twice per week 
mkuu wa shule na ninaendelea na daddy since paka sasa sorted and the parents told us that they are still uh, trying to see the diagnosis which they found was a problem with the kidney and now since that time she has been on and off uh, mainly now it reached a point whereby she has to go for dialysis at least twice a week making it very difficult for her to continue with her running Wow, that is such an inspiring story. Those are definitely the kind of friends you need to have. Very, very inspiring. Schoolgirls are actually doing this. Also, let's move now to Nyeri. What are the teachers saying about the upcoming strike? Yes, Nancy and Muru, the teachers in Nyeri through the Secretary General of NAT, the Nyeri branch, Mutahi Kahiga, insist that they will not relent and will continue with the strike. Remember that they issued a notice on the 26th of August intending to go on strike. Have, uh, and they listed uh, 37 grievances amongst them, commuter allowances and risk allowances for science teachers, amongst other complaints. And they said it is time the government took them seriously because they're tired of, you know, uh, going for strikes in and out and always trying to plead their case to the government. So the teachers in Nyeri say that they will join their colleagues in the other 46 counties of Kenya and they will go on with the strike. But on the same breath, the, the other member of parliament, Mary Wamboy, asked the teachers to at least try and be patient and try use diplomatic means because this is that time when students sit for their national examinations. Could they try and be patient and maybe see if the government will listen to their cries? But the teachers in Nyeri say that they are ready to roll their sleeves and go for strike. Have a we are reminding government that currently there is a hype for more money. We have seen how MCAs are behaving. We haven't demanded for cars ourselves. We have seen how the, the senators are also behaving. They, they are demanding more money. The MPs, we learned last night that most of them are taking five million home for doing nothing except walking around parliament. It is important that we say here that the 200 going to 300,000 teachers of this county, of this country, who are pushing the future of this nation, who are, whose future, whose Kenya's future is in their hands, need to be listened to. Wacha ni muambie mambo ya kweli. Kwa sababu hiku watu wengine wataka kuinsight. Na hii insight mendiyo hatutaki. Na ataka kuambia walimu wa Kenya. Wacha wakaya na serikali wa sugumuse. Na hii maneno hile itapatikana, ikipatikana mkata kidogo, tukule hiyo kidogo. Lakini kusema. All right, thank you very much, Carol, for joining us this evening on KTN Prime and bringing us up to speed with what's happening in that region. Have a good night. In Kajiado South, Maasai women have gone a notch higher in pursuit of formal education. Most of them can now read and write. A greater number of them have enrolled in adult literacy programs compared to men. And many of them joined the rest of the world in marking the International Literacy Day, which was marked worldwide yesterday. Here's uh, Dr. Kazwangira with the details. The hunger for literacy knows no bounds. In spite of their age, these women from Kajado South will do whatever it takes just to read and write. This determination has seen a record in the enrollment of adult literacy education among women. Compared to the men, more of them are enrolling. The 2,600 adult learners in the sub-county come from Kimana, Rombo, Mbirikani, Loitoktok, Kuku and internet. Nekatika ile mwaka moja tumeweza kufunza wakina mama na wazee pamoja. The men in the dominantly pastoralist community rarely have time for the classes. Some say... Hey, shundili ya kuya. But they have seen the great disadvantage of illiteracy and are determined to learn. Ba, 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 ajui. Hata kuhisabu ile pesa ni shida. Hata kurudishiwa ile change kuna wana ni shida. Hata kuhifadhi katika dengi ni shida. Hata kusa ile anaenda kutoa ni shida kwa sababu mbaka awe na mtu ambaye atakaya msaidia. As the world marked the International Literacy Day, over 400 women received trophies and certificates in Merahesh Kajiado South for their achievement. They had passed a major exam and can now read and write. Tunataka waweze kuanzisha 
biashara dogo dogo. This remarkable achievement by the Maasai women in an area that the total literacy level is below average is a clear indication that more people are embracing education in the country. Dorka Swangira, KTN News Desk. The battle over the use of thin SIM technology in Kenya took a new twist today after the Parliamentary Committee on Energy, Communication and Information suspended its use. According to the legislators, there is concern over the security with the overlapping SIM card that could put the brakes on Equity Bank's rollout of mobile services that is scheduled for next week. The latest move further pits the bank against Safaricom that has been opposed to the technology's use despite the Communications Authority backing its use. Charles Gitonga with the details on this latest development. In April, the Communication Authority licensed three mobile virtual network operators to roll out various mobile services. Recipients of the MVNO licenses were FinServe, a subsidiary of Equity Bank, Tangazas Mobile Pay Limited, and Zion Cell. Equity Bank's aim was to use its subsidiary to provide mobile money services to its over 8.6 million customers countrywide. The lender also brought to light its intentions to use a thin overlay SIM card which would operate on top of the normal SIM card. However, mobile telephony giant Safaricom expressed fears about safety of consumers' personal information, saying the thin SIM would pose dangers like intercepting calls, revealing short messages and infringing on the intellectual property of the primary SIM card. This would later form the foundation of the mobile banking battle between two firms in parliament, with each vigorously seeking the backing of parliamentarians. While appearing before Parliament's Committee on ICT and Energy, the Communication Authority defended its decision to allow Equity Bank to go ahead with the launch of its thin SIM service. The first concern was null and void because the international standards organizations, including ETSI, have okayed the use of SIM cards, but thin SIMs. Even as the authority affirmed that the thin SIM technology is approved by international service providers, including Group Special Mobile Association, GSMA, Parliament remained skeptical on how it would deal with counterfeits, as well as address other issues raised by Safaricom. However, before the conversation gained root, the parliamentarians learned that the authority is yet to seek approval of its board over the launch of thin SIM technology in Kenya. Can you really set a date for launching before the board has approved? What about if the board refused to approve? What would happen? In fact, this is not the only thing that is appearing before this committee, before the board approved. I'm shocked that uh, the board is not on board. The committee then called for the suspension of the planned rollout by Equity Bank planned for next week on Monday. The Communication Authority had planned to use this service as a lead mass test for the technology for one year before licensing other players. The future of the use of thin SIM technology now lies in the decision the board of the Communication Authority will make and thereafter vetting of the same by the Parliamentary Departmental Committee of Energy and ICT. Charles Gitonga, KTN. And the Communications Authority maintains its stand to regulate dominance of big players in the market. Now, former Pan-Africa Insurance CEO Tom Gitogo has been appointed the Deputy CEO of CIC Insurance in an apparent succession plan at the firm. In a statement sent to newsrooms, uh, the CIC board says Tom Gitogo will oversee the insurer's Kenyan business with plans for him to replace long-serving group CEO Nelson Courier. He joins CIC Insurance at the time it's looking forward to growing its regional presence with the Malawi and South Sudan markets on the radar. The company recently signed a joint venture deal with Malawi Union of Savings and credit cooperatives to start an insurance firm in Malawi and has already received a license to penetrate into South Sudan. And now the newly minted shares of the Nairobi Securities Exchange debuted today on the bulls with shares hitting a high of 18 shillings per share before settling at 16 shillings and 30 cents at the close of the market. Any investor who sold their shares made at least 71% profit in a matter of hours on the initial price of 9 shillings and 50 cents. Analysts say the share is bound to continue its winning ways at least 
in the short term and this excitement is sipping into the rest of the economy if announcements made during the listing are anything to go by. Adelaide Chingole has the details. The ringing of the bell marked the end of a five-year journey to turn the Nairobi Securities Exchange from a private members club to a listed firm. The process culminated in the most successful initial public offering and the momentum carried on today with the share closing at 16 shillings and 30 cents. We were seeking to raise 627 million at a price of 9.50 per share and investors applied for just over 500 million shares worth Kenya shillings 4.8 billion. The listing of NSC shares is the last stage in the demutualization process that began in 2009. The move separates the regulatory and the commercial sides of the NSC and gives the both funds needed to introduce new alternative instruments such as derivatives and the real estate investment trusts. The Kenyan farmer will be able to lock in the value of their produce in the future. This will enable our farmers to find the financing that is necessary to plant their crops based on future selling prices. The NSC will also use the funds to upgrade its trading platform to allow faster, easier and more secure trading as the NSC seeks deep in the capital markets. So that we can attain our objective of having 100 listed companies over the next four years and a market cap of 4 trillion shillings. And with the resource boom currently in the offing, thanks to the proven oil and mineral reserves, the government says it will utilize a new system to give Kenyans a stake in the management and utilization of natural resources in the country. We are asking companies to list in the security exchange uh, at least 20% of their shares. In the meantime, analysts say the NSC share will continue to do well, hitting a high of 25 shillings in the medium term as investors who got just 11% of their full allotment of shares drive up the price. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business. The National Sports Fund Board of Trustees has vowed to get straight to business with ensuring that proceeds of any sports lottery investments are to be paid into the fund, whereas financial support for sports persons and sports organizations are required to be paid out of the fund. The sports fraternity had for 10 years waited for national sports legislation in the name of the sports bill. In 2013, the bill which was passed by parliament provided for the establishment of Sports Kenya, a national sports fund, academy of sports and a tribunal for arbitration for sport matters. The issues touching on um, um, teams or persons wanting to travel abroad should be regulated by that office and it should be official that uh, they, have, they, have, they have registered with us. The 14 members include Sam Kairon Jondi as the chairman, Agnes Mandu, Frida Shirora and Jerito Gikaria, veteran athlete Catherine Dereba, Gupreet Sin, Adan Omar, the principal secretaries from both the Ministry of Sport and Finance, Attorney General, Director General of Sport Kenya, CEO of Kenya Academy of Sports and the Secretary of the Sports Dispute Tribunal. We will do due diligence to ensure that the requests made um, by the federations are genuine requests uh, and, and we of course uh, double up by counter checking the budgets and so that the support we give them as a ministry, the financial support is based on purely what is necessary to run that particular event. This sports fund is part of the government's Vision 2030 flagship project which through the sports lottery has an intended aim of injecting 500 million shillings into the sports budget annually. Victor Ogale, KTN Sports. The 2015 Africa Cup of Nations qualifying campaign continues in earnest on Wednesday with a cocktail of matches for football lovers across the African continent. South Africa, fresh from beating Sudan last week, will be looking to jolt Nigeria's hopes in the qualifying campaign.
Nigeria's Super Eagles have been marred by boardroom wrangles and Stephen Keshi will hope his charges are ready to take on Bafana Bafana at their backyard. East African side Rwanda hosts uh, Sudan in another cracker of a match with Algeria and Mali fighting it out in one of those matches expected to be a close contest. Some of the big guns were shocked in the opening qualifying campaign and will be extra careful to ensure that they bag valuable points in the subsequent matches. After the FIFA week, league matches resume all over the world during the weekend. <clears throat> Now, the 10th edition of the Cycle with the Rhino event has been launched in Nakuru today at the Lake Nakuru National Park. The event, which takes place annually, aims at raising funds to fence and secure the park's perimeter against human and wild animal uh, wild animals. Lake Nakuru Senior Park Warden Dixon Ritan has noted that this year's event scheduled to, to kick off on the 27th of September will host over 100 cyclists. So far 23 kilometers out of the 74 kilometers around the park have been fenced. 51 kilometers however remain unfenced. The annual event is expected to attract participants from the large Nakuru and its environs. Uh, for the other subsequent um, years, we have been raising a, a, an average of around 7 million. So far, we've started from one side, and uh, you know, you can't go jumping to every point. We know there are critical areas of uh, entry by poachers, but <clears throat> as at now, we are looking at um, running from one direction. So we've started this way, all the way up to somewhere called Lamuriak up there. The Big Q in association with Kenya Power. All right, time to wind up the bulletin. But uh, let's remind you of our big question tonight. We did ask you whether you believe the heckling at President Uhuru Kenyatta's Migori function was pre-planned. Lots of comments um, from... Um, Twitter and SMSs. And the poll results as well. 65% say yes, 35% say no. Let's take a look at your SMSs. This one from a local, Bernard from Migori, says, I doubt that those involved could plan the incident unnoticed. I think it was just local politics targeting the governor. Cleophas Muthama says, definitely it was pre-planned. Fellow youth, let's not accept to be misused by politicians for their own gains. Harrow from Mandera County says, there's no need to blame ODM supporters. It's the failure of security, especially intelligence. Information should have been shared in order for the president to maybe cancel his trip to Megori. Um, Patrick Kibe says, yes, the chaos were pre-planned. Why were there no chaos in Mombasa, yet most leaders are from court? And this very last one, Akiba Kanamaya has taken the sarcastic route. He says, maybe Ebola too is pre-planned by ODM. Jubilee should investigate the grievances of hecklers before pointing a finger. And I should have seen that coming as well. <laughs> That's right. Sweet. Wasiliana na marketing officer wa Kenya Power katika ofisi yoyote ya Kenya Power iliyo karibu nawe. Upate maelezo jinsi unavyoweza kupata stima kwa urahisi. Well, that's all we had prepared for you tonight. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. Have a very good night. My name is Wilson Buru. See you tomorrow. I'm Nancy Kachingere. It was great to have you with us. Let's uh, make a date tomorrow, 9 p.m. William Silla was our sign language interpreter. Good night from the Standard News Center.